Hi, my name is Mark Weldy, and I'm a professor at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm giving a tutorial lecture series for She Quantum. This is an organization intended to support women uh, doing research and, and learning in quantum information science. <clears throat> so what I'm going to lecture about is a topic called entanglement theory, which is an important topic in quantum information. It, it, it hits a variety of fields, including quantum computing, um, but also quantum communication and what I work on, which is called quantum Shannon theory, which is trying to understand the limits of communication. So in this lecture series, what we're gonna do is we're gonna break up these slides that I have here into 15 to 20 minute episodes. And, you know, I, th I think they'll be posted weekly or something like that, I'm not quite sure. So the topics that we'll cover, we'll start for some basics and we'll start with quantum states. And then we'll talk about quantum channels, which is how we, it's the mathematical language for that describes the physical evolution of quantum states. Then we'll, we'll define what's meant by an entangled state versus a separable state. Separable state is unentangled state. Then we'll talk about measures of closeness for quantum states, which are trace distance and fidelity. And these, these concepts are very important. They, they apply across the board in quantum information. Then I'll talk about the Bell experiment, which is one of the most important experiments in entanglement theory. Then we'll talk about some mathematical tests you can do to try to decide if a state is entangled or not. And then we'll wrap it up with methods for quantifying entanglement. And there's two approaches here. One is called the operational approach. The other is called the axiomatic approach. Okay, so without further ado, let's, let's start. Okay, a little motivation. What we were saying is, um, you know, quantum entanglement touches all fields of quantum information science. Why is that? It's a basic resource for quantum information processing. And in particular, there are protocols like teleportation and superdense coding, which are communication protocols. But teleportation gets used everywhere. It gets used in methods for quantum computing, in methods for quantum error correction. It gets used in quantum key distribution. So it's like a very basic protocol. And what you need to enable teleportation is entanglement. Okay, and then as we're saying it as applications in these different domains, I guess there are two I didn't mention yet, quantum networks. So this is if you have multiple parties who are trying to communicate across like a quantum internet, maybe they're trying to establish a secret key or communicate secretly or something like that. So entanglement can be useful there. And also in quantum sensing. So this is if you're trying to, um, for example, in the LIGO experiment, you know, which detects gravitational waves, you're trying to figure out the path length in an interferometer. And in order to do so, you have to do a, a, a sensitive measurement. And it's known that in principle, entanglement can improve how well you can, you can measure so that maybe you need less time to have a certain confidence in estimating some parameter like path length. Okay, so those are the different domains where entanglement theory is useful, but it's also important to understand it in a quantitative sense. And so that's what these lectures get into, okay? And what I mentioned before are there are two different approaches which are related, and you'll find this in entanglement theory if you consult other sources, they're called the axiomatic and operational approaches. Maybe I should, since I'm talking about sources, I should mention a source. Um, Sumit Khatri and I put out a book on the archive 
It's called Principles of Quantum Communication Theory, a Modern Approach. And in that book, we've dedicated a whole chapter to entanglement theory. And these lectures are really based on that. When I was preparing these slides, I was consulting the chapter that we wrote. So you can, you can use that for further reading on the topic. And it, it contains much of the, the modern understanding of entanglement. Okay, and we're focusing on uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics and finite dimensional quantum system for, for simplicity. So let's start. What is a quantum state? Maybe some of you know this, maybe some of you don't. This is just some picture of, of uh, something that I found on Google or Wikipedia for a quantum state. So mathematically, uh, the state of a quantum system is described by a square matrix called the density matrix, okay? So that's the approach we're gonna take here. If you learn quantum computing, you probably learn about the state vector and that's related to the density matrix, but we're gonna take the approach here that the state of a quantum system is given by a density matrix, okay? And what are the two requirements? If you've studied linear algebra before, then you probably learned about matrices and you might have learned about positive semi-definite and the trace of a matrix, okay? So in linear algebra, you learn about eigenvalues and eigenvectors and um, a quantum system, a, a, a quantum state is given by a Hermitian matrix. So what does that mean? It means that the entries can be complex numbers. However, um, the eigenvalues will be real, okay? And the matrix furthermore should be positive semi-definite. So the eigenvalues should be non-negative and the trace of a matrix you compute by summing the diagonal elements of the matrix. And it turns out that that's equivalent to summing up the eigenvalues. So those should sum up to one, okay? And then we write these conditions symbolically as Rho is greater than or equal to zero, meaning Rho is a positive semi-definite matrix and the trace is equal to one. Okay, and so sometimes we'll use this notation, Rho is an element of the D density operators. Okay, so we just read that as Rho is in the set of density matrices. Okay, and the dimension of this matrix indicates the number of distinguishable states of the quantum system. So for example, if it's a two by two matrix, then that is the, the state of a qubit, right? And then a qubit, you can in, encode one classical bit into a qubit. So a classical bit has two distinguishable states and the density, the quantum system for a qubit has two distinguishable states, right? So that's, that corresponds to the dimension. We can also have q trits, which are three-dimensional quantum states, right? So maybe an atom has a ground level, uh, a first excited state and a second excited state. And those are uh, three levels into which you can encode information, okay? And so the state of that atom will be described by a three by three density matrix. Okay, and this is what we just talked about for qubits. So what is the interpretation of the density operator? Um, really, it's all that you need to predict the outcomes of an experiment performed in a quantum system, right? So if we have a, a photon uh, that, that you know, can be horizontally polarized or vertically polarized, those are two degrees of freedom. So that's a qubit system and it's described by a qubit density operator. And then you could do a polarization measurement on that quantum system, on that photon. And that would, you know, the, the, the detector would click one way if, if the photon measurement came out to be hor horizontally polarized or it would click in a different way if the measurement outcome was vertically polarized. And if you want to predict the outcomes of this experiment on the quantum system, 
Then if you have a, a mathematical description of the state, which is given by the density operator, and if you have a mathematical description of the measurement, then you can compute probabilities um, that, that tell you like the probability distribution for the outcomes over many runs of this experiment. And indeed, a, a density operator generalizes a probability distribution. So if you studied probability theory before, then you've learned about, you know, like, so what is a classical bit? That can be a, a coin that has, you know, some probability for being heads and some probability for being tails. And so that's, that's a probability distribution. It's just described by two numbers and, you know, um, a density operator generalizes that because you, you have more numbers that can describe the state. Okay, and this is kind of what we were getting at that the slogan is essentially anything you can do classically, you can do in quantum, right? So quantum is in principle more powerful than classical because anything that can be done classically can be simulated by quantum systems. And um, one way to see that is that probability distributions that correspond to classical theories, they can be embedded into a quantum state. And what you do is you just place all the probabilities along the diagonal of the density matrix. So what are some properties of density matrices? The set of density matrices is convex, okay? So what does that mean? It means if I have one density operator and another, and I take a probabilistic mixture of them. So if I pick a probability, which is a number between zero and one, and I place that weight on the first density operator, and I place the complementary probability as a weight on the second density operator and I add, this right here is a legitimate density operator. And the interpretation is that, well, the system is with some probability P in the state sigma zero, and with, with some probability one minus P in the state sigma one. Okay, so we're saying that density matrices or density operators, in these lectures, when I say operator or matrix, I mean the same thing. So you can just think matrix when you hear operator. So a density operator can have dimension greater than or equal to two. Um, if that happens, it's instead of qubit, it's called qdit for D dimensions. And you can write it in this way, um, where rho i, j are the matrix elements. So you could list those out in a table like you would in linear algebra. Alternatively, this is a compact way of writing it, where um, these i, j's are the, the standard basis elements for a vector space. OK. Um, so one thing from linear algebra that we know is that since, as, since every density operator is positive semi-definite, which means in particular that it's Hermitian, it has a spectral decomposition of this form where these PXs are eigenvalues and they can be interpreted as probabilities so that they're non-negative and that they sum to one. And these phi x's are orthonormal eigenvectors, OK? And some terminology, we say that a density operator rho is pure if there exists a unit vector such that you can write it as the outer product of that vector with its transpose, with its, comp with its, with its conjugate transpose. And um, so that, what does that mean? Um, it's pure if the rank of the state of the matrix is one and otherwise it's mixed, okay? So if it's pure, the interpretation is that it's definitely in the state side. If it's mixed, you can think of it as like a probabilistic mixture of different states. Okay, why don't we stop the first lecture there, that was about 15 minutes. And the next time we'll pick up 
with describing multiple quantum systems.